Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's Skeptic Autopsy. Hey, I know I've been, I wasn't around. You know, again, life hold me back. You know, getting shit together. You know, I'm finally got through all my classes. I finally tied up some loose ends with, in terms of assignments and work and whatnot. Uh, I've been packing and whatnot. Like, literally, all my stuff is like literally in my hotels, like, you know, near the, the door. It's like all packed up, ready to go. Uh, coming this Saturday, you know, I've been kind of, I kind of had my hands full, so I didn't really have enough time for this whole YouTube thing, but, you know, uh, ironically enough, through all the maelstrom and dismay I've been going through this, you know, last days of this uh, semester, I still was able to find some time to put for myself to uh, look at the recent Mortal Kombat movie that came out this, they came out this month, and, uh, Pretty much, of course, you know, I saw it, so I automatically had to jump to this and make a video for it and whatnot. So, yeah, while well, further ado, I'll actually get to the critique. Um, Alright, for start, this movie itself, like prior before watching it, I kind of was kind of aware of all the controversy it was getting before it even came out. Like, the fact that some dumb bitch said where was Chun Li in this film, although those are two complete two completely different games. And again, that's just an example of how we just how more or less we just let, you know, outsiders yeah, I know that sounds like really pretentious, but you know, hang on when I say this. You let outsiders, but more specifically people who don't really, you know, consume this kind of media, but just have only just the bare, you know, knowledge of it. How we let people like that enter you know, your circle, your, your your little playground, and they pretty much fuck shit up for everyone else there. The whole enjoyment factor. And, you know, considering we make idiotic statements like where's Chun-Li in the Mortal Kombat movie? I mean, even someone with, like, even one trait of a brain cell would know that those are two completely different games in their own different continuity. The next thing was about the, the, the director's really asinine statement he made about how why Johnny Cage wasn't in this film is because he'll be too much like uh, he'll be too too much like Kano who by the way is the best you know character in this movie which I'll get to later but until like you know address all the little bullshit controversy about there of course the fact okay pretty much he didn't want Johnny Cage in it because he'll be too much like Kano which again if you actually looked into the source material that you're adapting, that you're writing, you should know that those are two completely different characters. Yeah, they're kind of more, you know, passe than most of the other characters in the game. They really kind of don't really tend to take shit that seriously. It's kind of a big game to them for, for the most part. But, again, that's literally just where they, they're similar at and everything else is where they're completely different at in terms of that. In terms of you know, character archetypes and understandings. So, yeah, that, that's just one thing. All right. This film, in terms of cinematography, it looks like, it looks like, it, could, it looks like a, a TV movie, like, you know, HBO or something made this, or you can obviously tell it's really B-movie. Like, like it, it's really hitting a B-movie territory, which is fine because this movie had a really, really, I wouldn't say low budget, but it had a really medium budget, like, you know, a budget one wouldn't usually, uh, you know, pay, you know, usually wouldn't use, you know, productive move to, to make a movie, but in terms of cinematography, some of it being obvious that, you know, they cut corners, and some of it obviously just being really cheap, I feel like for the most part, they really did pull it off. Like in terms of the set designs, you know, with showing destruction and breakage and what may have you, they were able to pull it off. Even with that really popular uh, scene when uh, when Sub Zero more or less froze some water or something, you know, made a hailstorm of ice when he tried to kill the main character of the movie, Carl Carl Young. Like you can obviously tell where they were cutting corners, and some scenes are like. Almost looked like they were literally just shot in some, like, desert in Arizona somewhere. And, you know, they just 
touched it up by putting some stuff around and having some people around. Like, in some cases, it was really obvious how cheap it was. But at the same time, in some scenes, they really did pull it off. So, in terms of cinematography and set designs, it, Good. it was pretty good. Anyway, uh, yeah, in terms of set designs and backgrounds and whatnot, it was... It was acceptable, I would say. Like some in some cases, it was really fucking obvious. In some cases, it was it was fine. Like the whole ice storm sequence was was it was fine. Or even uh, the whole little temple scene, you know, where pretty much like where most of like ninety nine percent of the uh, setting of this film takes place in was decent. Or not nothing like that cage fighting scene with you know, I mean, I, I should have already put like spoilers like yeah that's just kind of how I do you know these really you know objective you know analytical breakdowns of films like yeah no no shit I'm getting the spoilers it's just kind of just the way you know my craft is I mean. Like, yeah, of course, it's going to be spoilers. But, yeah, spoilers at the end, of course, you know. Uh, I mean, if you ever played the game or even or even if you know, like, the basic gist of the game story, you know that, you know, Scorpion kills Sub-Zero. Like, that's a no-shocker. I mean, he did it, like, he killed Sub-Zero in the original uh, uh, game timeline. He did it in 9. He did it in uh, that uh, animated movie. He did it in, in this one. Like, it's... It's kind of like no surprise, and that's pretty much how the movie ended. Like, fucking spoilers, or <coughs> like, no shit. Like, yeah, if you know the series enough, or even know a basic gist of it, yeah, that's kind of what happens. Um, so, yeah, uh, in that scene, pretty much when they were fighting, it was obvious that they just literally took some rinky dink, you know, pit fight place and just. Literally just put a bunch of, you know, slash CGI slash, you know, background decorations around and make it seem like it's like frozen and whatnot. So, yeah, like scenes like that just stick out like a sore fucking thumb. And that's like literally the only parts where it's like bad scenery or really obvious cut corners, cheap and amateur uh, set designs come from. Uh, the characters themselves are, although despite of the controversy, actually do act a bit, uh, do act accordingly to what they're based on for the most part. Uh, Liu Kang's your stoic MC, although he's not really the MC of the movie. It, it, it goes to Carl Young, and it, it kind of bounces back to forth to Scorpion. You know, of course, he ties in with Carl Young, Carl. Carl Young being his ancestor. Yeah, because, you know, Scorpion Sub-Zero is not in, you know, their feud, their history wasn't set in modern times. Uh, uh, juxtaposed as it is in the games, their feud, you know, lasted in like the 1700s by the start of this film, give or take. Uh, 17th century, uh, you'd be correct, my bad. And pretty much... Literally, Raiden, after all the Maelstrom, you know, the Shirai Ryu were wiped out. You know, Raiden literally comes, takes his infant daughter, brings her back, you know, to Earth Realm. And, you know, it pretty much goes down the tube with uh, Carl Young. And Carl Young is a distant ancestor of uh, Scorpion. Uh, Carl Young himself is a self insert character, like, essentially. What would it be like if someone like me was in Mortal Kombat or, you know, fill in a blank? That, that's simply just the role he plays in this film. I mean, yeah, he is kind of static. He is kind of, you know, has the depth of a fucking pun. But that's simply just literally the role. He that his literally his only role he plays in this film. Like, he's simply just a self-insert character. Like... Uh, a name tag character that's essentially literally his own his his sole role of this. Like, I mean, they say he's like the champion of of, of the of the tournament when he killed Goro, but it was kind of not really sure. It wasn't really concrete. Like he was the the champion, but 
the tournament, yeah, it plays in this in this movie story, but not to what people think. Like it's kind of minute. Like Shang Tsung just does whatever the fuck he wants. Every time he sees even the most uh it, every time he even sees like even one of the most smallest opportunities he takes it, which actually it's more in the characteristic with Quan Chi. I mean but Anyway, yeah, that's that's literally the whole thing, the whole case scenario in terms of like you know the actual structure of how the tournament in this movie works. Uh, Kano again, like I said, is the best character in this movie. I mean, he's he's just as you know one would expect. He's brash, he's cutthroat, he's a hoodwinking motherfucker. He you know he's a now type of guy, like you know fuck. Uh, fuck Tuesday or Wednesday. I want this shit now. I want it at eight o'clock, not eight oh one o'clock, not eight oh two o'clock type of guy. You know, if you kind of get you know basic synopsis, you know he's a a now or never type of guy. Uh, and yeah, again, he's the best character in this in this movie. Like he's he's the most like he's the most flated character. He's the most realistic character if you were actually placed in Mortal Kombat. Juxtaposed to Carl Young's self-insert character. And he's brash, just like in the original continuity. And they kind of did a weird spin in the film. Like, uh, for a long time, people thought Kano was, like, going to be part of the Earth Realm Warriors, like the good guys. But, actually, that wasn't really the case. And they kind of did, I guess you can say, a subversion. But, really, it just does seem like something that is in tune to the Kano's character. Um, Sonya kidnaps him. And more or less keeps him tied up in his rinky dink house. And Reptile comes in. Melts his chains. He promptly murders Reptile. And he and he joins her. To more or less the place where. Liu Kang and Kung Lao were teaching the Earth Realm Warriors. And for a while he spends time with them. He unlocks his power, you know, instead of actually having the eye, the, the eye laser cyborg thing, he actually does have heat vision through one eye in this film. And Cabal pretty much promptly comes to him and tells him, more or less, you make money now, but if you work for Outworld, you'll make more money. And pretty much that was enough just to sway him, which, yeah, in hindsight is... Kind of really stupid, but actually that seems a lot in tune to Kano's character. Although you can see what the director did or writer with those switcheroo, you know, in Mortal Kombat 9, really, uh, Kano tried to convince Cabal to join them, and they kind of did a whole switcheroo thing going on here. Uh, and Cabal, of course, if I'm going to talk about him, he's like really uncharacteristic in this. Like, again, it seems like the writers had a vague understanding of some of these characters. I mean, Cabal is, yeah, he was villainous. Like, in the 3D PS2 era games, he was, he did go back into villainy, you know, or whatnot. But they just think he's just a really fast guy. And he, and he kind of sounds like, uh, he kind of sounds like uh, Captain Cole from Injustice in this movie. And it kind of, it, it seems uncharacteristic, like his voice alone. Like, his mannerisms uncharacteristic. This film only thinks he's just a fast bounty hunter guy with swords. Like, yeah, that is, those are traits of his character, but that's not exactly his character. But, you know what, fuck, I'll let it slide at this point, because it pretty much does work in the benefit of uh, Kano's character, how he acts, and pretty much... Literally the only real, I would say, accurate things they've done in terms of character arcs in this movie uh, compared to its source material. But if I were to more or less judge this by, by on its own, I would. it's pretty kind of mixed with me. Like, hey, join us so you can make money. I already make money in Earth Realm. If you join Outworld, you make more money. Oh, okay. I'm evil again. Or... or you know, he always was evil, but, like, I'm reimbursed now to join Outworld. Like, like if you look at it on its own, it's it's really silly, but... 
if you compare the source material, it makes perfect sense. Like, he's kind of like this conniving, backstabbing son of a bitch. And pretty much, in both terms of continuities, it makes sense. Although, uh, I think it, you, it has to take more than that just to sway someone to, you know, take a job if they just get more money. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, that's, that's a really, it's a simple one. Like, you make more more money than you usually do. Like, a get quick, like, a get rich quick scheme. But, literally, that's literally just what happened. You'll make more money if you join Outworld. Boom. He's a fully realized antagonist. And he just, he essentially just becomes, he just simply becomes, he simply just works towards Outworld's efforts literally just for Sonya to promptly finally murder him or injure him. Maybe he actually might get an eye laser in the next movie because, yeah, this movie kind of set up just to make a sequel. Like, yeah, Red Volcano's dead for having a, you know, a gnome shoved to his face or, you know, he's just really injured. So he might that might explain this eye laser thing from the <coughs> original continuity. <laughs> like, it goes... <coughs> It goes, it, that, that can lead, it, that obviously was just made to lead into something else. Or maybe he did just get killed. Like, when I saw it, that, or that's the way I can interpretate his whole character arc and more or less his final scene with Sonya. Uh, Sonya is literally, is, is also a character they were able to nail down. I mean, he's a bit more hot-headed than... She usually is, and again, she kind of just gets random power-ups, like when she randomly kills Melina in this film. Like, she does one of the signature attacks from the games, literally just out of the blue. Like, yeah, she was training, you know, to unlock her spirit powers, how this movie calls it. Like, they, they, they treat, like, these Mortal Kombat characters have quirks, like it's... My Hero fucking Academia, but no, it's just like Luke Kane can just always fire a fireball because he just can. Like, it, it, it was never, you know, it, it didn't have a name. It didn't really need one. Like, Sub-Zero shot ice because he can, like, because he has the ability to. Aside from that bullshit thing about him being Outworld Descent in the PS2 games, but he simply shot ice because he can. And this movie kind of explained why everyone can do powers, which they really didn't need to. They do them because they just can. Because, like, if it's the continuity of the, of the series, like, you know, you train a lot and you reach, you know, your power. It, it didn't really need any, you know, clarification. Like, but I guess they only did that simply to people who are not familiar with it. Like, you know, it's double standards on that, but that's besides the point. Uh, it's just needless information to explain something that really didn't need to. Like, you know, a simple glance at it can actually tell tell you tell you more of why it exists opposed to actually giving it, you know, detail, so to speak. Um... Yeah, Liu Kang's pretty much the same character. Kung Lao is kind of more of a mentor character. Despite how in the original game series he always was kind of like a arrogant dick. But that's kind of why we liked him. And because of the fact he's a mentor character slash an arrogant dick kind of character. And he also brings up the great Kung Lao. Although it really doesn't go anywhere because he Shang Tsung ends up killing him. Like... Yeah, I know I keep bringing that, bringing that a lot. How literally they try to they they, they give these pseudo establishments of these characters just only promptly kill them one by one throughout the film. So every time like characters bring up something, you know that might seem integral, like Kung Lao talking about the great Kung Lao, it really doesn't mean much because he's just you know killed by Shang Tsung halfway in the movie, which inspires Liu Kang. To kill Cabal and, you know, fight the Outworld fighters. And, like, you set it up just for it to literally go nowhere. You set these pseudo-establishments for these characters. Which was personally one of my biggest problems with this film. 
the pseudo establishments literally for it not to go anywhere when they're promptly killed off. Kind of almost feels like the plot to Gantz a little bit every time they introduce new characters. But, uh, yeah, that's just, <laughs> like, literally one of the big pet, pet peeves in terms of how they wrote characters in this. Like, one thing that really didn't make any fucking sense, if you even know the, like, even if you don't even know the game, but you know the basic gist that Melina is obviously, you know, a clone, a, a literal homunculus of Katana. And again, this movie also has a lot of member berries. You literally see Katana's fan as some, you know, antique. You'll find Shinnok's uh, amulet as an antique. It's just pure member berries in this film. Like, they have her fan. She's not in this film yet. Melina is. And Melina... Although, I don't have no problem with it. Melina's black. Because I guess, you know... In the, in the original game, Melina was always really horrid looking. She was ugly. So, I guess the black girl has to be ugly. But, whatever. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> literally is <coughs> Melina's presence in this game really just leads to more questions like, uh, where's Katana? Or have they ran into her before? Like, you have her clone, but you don't have the person she's based on, she's modeled on. And that just bring that will just itself brings up a lot of questions. Until we don't get them because, you know, Sonya just murders them. Again, setting all these a step you're Set all these pseudo establishments for these characters. Literally it for not to go fucking anywhere when you just kill them off. Yeah, I get it, Mortal Kombat's really popular fatalities, but that's kinda of why this that's kinda of why why it kinda of fails in that point. You focus on, yeah, the part the the things about Mortal Kombat that people like, essentially over telling a cohesive story. With all these enriching characters and whatnot. Just only... Just kill them off. Like, I get it. They want to show fatalities. And it's perfectly fine if they can. But, again... You can't do it... Just to kill off characters. Because they need to die. So you can just shoehorn more characters in the next film. Like, these characters are barely established. They're barely fleshed out. You you barely actually understand them. You never, you're never given enough time to understand them, and them themselves they discuss a lot of things, just for them to get killed off. Like, I keep going back to that, but that's literally one of the biggest anchors in this movie story, in in this movie period. Like its themes, its concepts in general. Yeah, Melina is black. I'm fine with that. I mean, where the fuck is Katana? Like, it's. It, again, that would just only lead to more questions. And uh, she, at first she has a regular mouth, but when she gets angry, you know, when she's getting her ass beat, it kind of turns to one reminiscent from the video game, the no lips and the thing going on, Tarkatan mouth and all that. Um, yeah, she's promptly killed off. Like, any way of explaining, you know, Katana, like, how she works here or why the fuck even her fan is there? I guess you can they, you can infer that Liu Kang had a run in with her, but the fact that Melina is with the out is with the Outworlders, wouldn't that kind of like, wouldn't that like be kind of like a parent, like someone like Liu Kang would bring that up, or you know anyone running that little monastery that that, that most of the movie takes place in, wouldn't they like even bring that up like even once or like even like have a soft like remark like oh yeah you remind me of your sister or you remind me of somebody of a blue ninja like it's never really brung up it, it's they just expect you to know because if you played the game or see the game or even have a minute knowledge of the game you're expected just to know it on the fly despite it's never really flushed out that's kind of what happens when you just fill your movie up with a bunch of member berries uh one thing I was kind of impressed with is that this movie actually introduced Natara. And unlikely from the animated movie where she literally has just a cameo where she barely even talks. And, you know, she actually does look like her Deadly Alliance look. This one, she's... <laughs> she's, 
she's a character, right? Like, like she has established dialogue, but literally in the ten minutes she's introduced, it said she's literally just a fuck buddy for Shang, for Shang Tsung. She's a fuck buddy for Shang Tsung, and she promptly gets killed by Kung Lao through a, a fatality done with his hat. But the thing is, you know how Natara is, you know, a fighter, you know. Yeah, literally, she tries this thing where she tried to get Kung Lao on his blind side so she could strike. Like, you can see where they were setting up, you know, her strategy and whatnot. But literally, she, it, it's literally the most, un, it's literally the most inoffensive thing she done. Like, she's literally, she doesn't even do, like, any iconic moves or anything. She literally just flies around a bit and tries to get Kung Lao on his blind spot. So she could take him out or drink his blood or whatever. You know, kind of like her fatality where she literally just drinks the opponent's blood. Like, like there's no reference of that. And compared to her, you know, her design on, you know, uh, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance where, you know, there actually does seem to be a straight of effort put into it. You know, the eye patch, but it's kind of like a cloth. You know, the pony, the... Asianic ponytail she had, the, the heels, like, the, the drape she was wearing, like, yeah. No, in this, she's just some literally half-naked lady with giant bat wings. I think she's, like, Hispanic, the, the girl who plays her or something. And then, yeah, she barely throws a punch or fights and just is killed off literally in the, in the first ten minutes she's introduced. And that's pretty much just about it about Natara. Like, I like Natara, but she's barely, like, you know, relevant in this movie. Like, I thought there would be a little more TLC with most of these characters, but I guess not. Uh, pretty much most of the Outworld characters are just cronies. And they're kind of actually treated as uh, jokes in this. Uh, kind of really... Standard, kind of really uh, normal in terms of uh, modern Mortal Kombat. Where the villains are kind of treated like jokes. Even with that bullshit aftermath story with MK11. It really kind of made no difference. Because Liu Kang just ended up changing the timeline for that game anyway. So, literally all the villains getting a W meet, meant nothing in the long run. And, <laughs> literally that plays a thing with this movie. Like, the villains are kind of treated like jokes. Like, they seem as a threat. They're dangerous, for the most part. They, and they weren't entirely pushovers, but at the same time, they were simply just made to just get killed and probably replaced with new villains in the later films. Because, you know, you just got to get those member berries in. Although, it doesn't really make any sense why Reiko was working for Shao Kahn. Reiko was introduced in MK4. He, he was more of a, you know, try to, he tried to become the new Shao Kahn. If anything, he might, like, try to overthrow Shao Kahn. But, no, Reiko is just literally some guy with a hammer. He barely looks recognizable. And he's just also, again, just made to be promptly killed for Jax. Who, again, goes through, like, the same character arc he boys had. About him losing his arm. His arms. And this is the weird thing about Jax. Like, like, with had, like, Reiko, he literally, like, had no lines of dialogue, like, at all. Most of it was just him yelling like a retard. But, yeah. Yeah, Jax actually goes to a character arc. And one thing that really got me in this film is when, when Sub-Zero literally freezes his arms off and rips them off. He literally also drops Jax on his head. When he fell down the abandoned building floor. And he still survives from it. Like you heard the impact of his head hitting. Like you know the second floor. Like you think the fall of that alone would have killed him. Like the fact that he crushed his fucking skull. That could have killed him. But no it just. He, it's, Jax was just kind of treated like as Sub-Zero's meat bag. Just to show how strong he was. Although. There were plenty of scenes that already illustrated that. So, yeah, pretty much he has one of the most, you know, 
repeated and recurring character arcs in the story where he's dealing with the loss of his arms and having new arms and pretty much it's resolved quickly when Kano laser when Kano laser beams the statue on Sonya and for some reason when he lifts the statue off of her he gets an auto upgrade where they turn white and pretty much he's used to having metal arms from that point like it's like you know something traumatic like that you know losing your arms and getting new metal ones and having to deal with it like you might think there might be this like you know this really long winded you know character arc or be more uh, uh, you know tra traumatic but no he just Kano zaps the statue on Sonya he lifts it off of her like Cyborg from the episode when he had to fight uh, Keith David from the Teen Titan cartoon. He literally pushed his limit to the point where he got a random upgrade. Although even the arms he had prior to there doesn't even look like the same ones he got from the upgrade. But whatever. To save her and then he gets over it. And then he kills uh, Reiko in the film. With his head smashing fatality. Like. I mean. You would think it would be more. Like he has. He has the most. Like. He, he has the most recurring. Like. Uh, uh, backstory in this film. But. It's eventually. It's eventually solved. As soon as you know. It, it, as soon as it's. It, as soon as it's shown. Like. It, it, it's kind of like. Eh. Like, Jax had three games from the current timeline dealing with it and all that. And yeah, okay, granted, this is a, a, a one-hour movie, but still, as soon as, you, as soon as he was dealing with hardships with it, he eventually got over it. Which, yeah, I guess he's a soldier, you know. But, I don't know, it just seemed pretty botched that, that his whole arc in this, in this film... Uh, Raiden pretty much is the same character he's always been. He's always been like the oracle, you know, the wise one. You know, he was essentially, you know, the coach for Earth Realm in his film. He kind of literally, you know, set everything up in his film. Like, he's kind of responsible for why Carl Young is who he is and, you know, Scorpion and all that and whatnot and pretty much serving as somewhat of a serving a part in Scorpion's redemption arc in this movie, so to speak, in this film. Which in a long time was actually literally the most accurate accurate ways like any source of media has ever portrayed Scorpion. Like he's always been a really neutral, you know, character. He's not really evil. He just he's kinda just essentially a vengeful and whatnot. He wants his soul and clan to rest and he thinks killing Sub Zero and Quan Chi and anyone, any other conspirators of his clan's death will, you know, satisfy his soul and the souls of his loved ones. So, yeah, it's the most accurate one. He's neutral. He's not with Earth Realm or Outworld. He's his own thing. Uh, and yeah, this, and pretty much, of course, Scorpion steals the show. As soon as he's shown. With his uh, fight with Sub-Zero. Who apparently can live forever. Because it's literally like Bihan. You know. The perpetrator. And he's brought up in modern time. And he hasn't aged a bit. Or it's not no like. Direct ancestor. Like it's the same one from before. So I guess the movie just wants to assume. That he's immortal or. He's long living or something, I guess. Well, he's obviously not immortal because he gets killed, but they just expect you to think, yeah, yet he got the same shit as Raiden or Shang Tsung. He just has internal you for he can live forever. Like, they just expect you to, to think that despite he literally didn't age a day and he's literally the exact same character. 
And essentially had to take Scorpion that long just to take a vengeance on him. And this really weird scene where he was fighting him, pretty much literally one of the best fights in the, in the movie, admittedly. It's a fusion of him and Carl Young fighting Sub-Zero. Carl Young promptly gets his ass beat, and Scorpion pretty much has to finish the job. And throughout this whole scene, he keeps taking on and off his mags. Like, he took off his mags in one scene to show, you know, Sub-Zero that he was Hanzo Hattori. I mean, Hanzo Hasashi. God, I'm getting it fucked up now. Hanzo Hasashi was Scorpion. It was him. Like, Scorpion was the name he, adap he adopted, you know, since his death. So, yeah, he rev he takes the mags off, reels himself, and then promptly puts it back on. And then he takes it off in front of Carl Young. And then he puts it back on. And then he takes it off to kill Sub-Zero with his flame breath fatality. And then he puts it back on. And then he says, I'm redeemed. And then he goes away. And that's literally all we get about Sub-Zero. And essentially, he was like the, the showstopper of this film. And I guess for the most part, he did surface that part well, for the most part. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much all I got about the about that on characters uh what i can make about the music is some of it is its own shit like you know something they were working up on and some of it was like modern modern remixes to the to the, the original mortal Kombat themes from back in the day like the one from the original movie that everyone thinks is good although this is way better because they actually does have more of the spirit of it is it and isn't funny un unironically like the original one so pretty much yeah in terms of music it's literally the one from the 90s just remixed it's got this like you know tip typical techno trap babble put onto it you know to make it seem hip and cool and up for the ages man although it just sounds like schlock that literally can't even hold a candle to the original the soundtracks just sounds like just remade slock of whatever genre is popular at the time. Like, I know you want to, like, you know, that was their way of trying to, you know, keep relevant. But it just seems, it just seems, it seems corporate. It has corporate spray, spray, uh, can written all over it. Uh, the story is, yeah, pretty much good guys versus bad guys, essentially. I mean, Kano being more, you know... Yeah, you know, you expected that he w he was going to be up to any good, despite being part of him. But really, in terms of that, it's your basic good versus evil plot. Uh, and pretty much, you kind of knew from, like, the, the beginning half of the movie, the opening, which was really well made and scripted and set designed and whatnot. You knew eventually that was going to be, like, really apparent. You know that was going to serve as a major point towards the end of this film, so... Yeah, like, you kind of expected, like, Sub-Zero was going to get his revenge. I mean, the trailers alone kind of told a lot about it, so. And if you kind of know the basic gist of the series or are a fan of the series, you kind of know that him killing Sub-Zero, their whole little squabble, was, their whole quarrel has just always been really one of the selling points of the franchise in terms of the story and concept. Uh... So yeah, that's literally all I got about all I had to say about this. Like, I'm gonna have to give this like a, because I personally actually like this. I like this film, but I wouldn't say I like it unironically. I like it, but it's just this movie. This movie it, it was it was in development for like years, and. It just came off just being really, really average. Uh, it's I got more like an adequate, kind of like in between, exceptional and uh, obsolete. It's like it's it's a fine line between those both. If I were to rate this film, um, so yeah, like the, you expect a movie like this in development, be in development this year. You know, the story might be better and the characters might be a bit more flushed out, but it just comes up really short and average. But considering this movie does capture the feel of Mortal Kombat, 
despite of the member berries and uh, really uh, questionable and uh, a questionable writing in this film, it still captures the spirit of Mortal Kombat more than any other actually in, uh, in, uh, media interpretation up to this point. I mean, the animated one was pretty good too, but that's simply why I just like it. It's just it 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 knows where it's it knows what series is adapting, and it's not holding back on it. It's just the terrible storytelling. It just really holds it back. Like, uh, oh yeah, and uh, Goro's in this film, and Carl Young kills him when he literally gets gold saint armor from his bloodline with Sub Zero, because I guess bloodlines make you grow gold saint armor that gives you spiked tonfas. But yeah, that's, that's really just all I got on that. Like, I really want to like this movie, and I, and I did enjoy it. It it was digestible. I liked this movie. I might like you know when I'm drunk, I might like go back to this or something, or you know when I need like me a you know my Mortal Kombat addiction, you know, going on. <laughs> I will go back to it, but really, aside from it, it's not good. But I still enjoy it, and I just had to give it an adequate. Like seeking an obsolete with some of it like in an exceptional simply for the fact that it actually was kind of really adapted, but in terms of story and character is really where it fell short in this so yeah, if you like the review, if you like this video, if you like you know me talking about movies and any pieces of media like music or TV shows or what may have you, you know, subscribe to this channel, click the notification bell because that's the only time you actually know when I submit videos for some reason. Uh, you know, give a like, tell people about this channel, tell people you like about this, tell people you don't like about this channel. Like, you know, get the name out, get the word out. Uh, comment down below what you felt, comment down below if you feel like I was being too harsh or... I, I should have been harsher, like some people say. Uh, you know, just type away down in the comment section what you felt about it. Yeah, so yeah. Like always, man, the Eye of the Storm is watching y'all.